this this picture is, is taken of Grand Bank Harbor in 1910, uh, in the in the spring, I would say, of say later part of March or early April, when all the all the vessels were in, fitting for the bank fishery. A, f a few days after this picture was taken, uh, the brook, all the ice in the river came down and uh, took every hull out. There was considerable damage done to rails and spars and so on, but uh, that was soon fixed and they resumed their normal work. As far as uh, our family was concerned, we, we entered the uh, deep sea fishery in 1900. And my father, in partnership with the late J.B. Patton, formed the business was later known as Patton and Farsi. Uh, they operated in the, deep sea, in the deep sea fishery for right up to 1922 when the partnership was dissolved. And each went his own way and formed their own individual businesses and carried on from there. The bank fishery has been in Grand Bank since 1888. And uh, the late Samuel Harris uh, was, the, was the first man to go deep sea fishing from Grand Bank. And from there it developed right up to say 15 years ago when the last banker finished. In the early days there was no harbor. Uh, what what you have in Grand Bank now for a harbor was at that time only the mouth of a brook. And vessels for the whole year wouldn't come in. They discharged their catches on, on outside of the pier. And uh, when the fall came, they were carried on the other side of Fortune Bay and moored up. And brought back in the spring and refitted. We had no harbor here. After the loss of the General Bean, my father was went master of the General Golf. He was master of her for several years, and in 1935 they left Lisbon in Portugal en route to Newfoundland, and was never heard from later afterwards. I came over here in the year 1915 and uh, I stayed in St. Lawrence two years and a half and then I came to Grand Bank. In Grand Bank I went banking for one year and after we got down in Bay St. George we lost our spas and came back and went to St. Pierre and got a new set of spas. After that I quit banking and came and went on coasting. From coasting we went far and gone and uh, during the year 1917, we lost uh, our vessel going across to Porto with a load of fish, and uh, we was picked off by an American man of war. And uh, we stayed aboard there from uh, the time we was picked off 
and we went over to France, came back to Halifax. That was just after the explosion in Halifax. And we stayed there for a couple of days and then we came on home. called the A.B. Run, and coming from Halifax we struck an August gale and the vessel hauled out and it beam in in the night 12 o'clock in the night and the captain had me tied to the foremast and the coop tied on the other side and he hollered out to lower the to hoist the jumbo and when we I couldn't get cleared, I was tied on, and the cook couldn't get cleared, he was tied on. But after a while, we managed to get rid of it somehow, I don't know now, I just forget how we got cleared. And when we went to get the heist the jumbo, the halyards asked to be coiled up on the chain, and that was turned bottom up. And she was laying hatches in the water then. But all to save us, we had packed hay in the forward hole. We had kerosene barrels and kerosene in them, of course, in the bottom, with hard coal on top. And when we got in St. Lawrence, that's where we got in. In lots of places, the oil was on deck and the coal in on it, and big scallops took out of the beams where the chimes from the barrel dug in them, cut with sheep holes right out. And there was a big bark then driving down on us in the night. No ways at all. And he, uh, we got the jumbo on her and he hold, ran her off for the wind and jived her over and then she came back a lot to the coal ship to the end. And the mate, there were two brothers, the captain and me, he had his little boy aboard, it was August, and he got afraid and his father had him stay down the cabin with him and the cabin fell full of water. Not full now, but up so much up the bench. And he couldn't get up. And the next day, it was still blowing, storm. Me and the captain was tied onto the mammoths. And I had a rope parted, the say sucker, and the rope parted, and land two of us up in the rigging. If we'd have been a little further back, we'd have went overboard, two of us, but we struck the, we struck the rigging, and that brought us up. Turk was a load of salt bound for uh, Grand Bank, Newfoundland. So we soon, soon after clearing from Bermuda, outside of Bermuda, we ran into heavy, the heavy weather and she started to put, leak water badly. So we kept coming. We hadn't seen any any boats passing in the lanes, in the regular travel, traffic lanes, for some time. And we kept coming, pumping and pumping and pumping. And uh, we got as far as uh, about 200 miles outside of Halifax. When, uh, we discovered that the salts she didn't seem to be getting the water from the pumps. The salts seemed to be working down the mountain and working down in the pumps, so it looked like it was time to, to get, get, get away from her. And uh, it blowing a nice breeze of wind when this boat hove in sight, and he had me come right straight for us. And when he came down and asked our trouble, we told him that the vessel was leaking badly and we were looking for assistance wanting to be taken off. So he... Uh, he came down the, low, the winter of us and uh, lay the winter of us and he sent down his own boat and took us all aboard and uh, we scuttled her and left her. Most of our fish went in boat to, to uh, European markers, that is Portugal and Spain. They took the most of it. But in later years, uh, there was a lot of packaging of fish done for the West Indies and Brazil. They were carried in our own bottoms mostly. Uh, various businesses here had two or three foreign going vessels, which they used for that purpose. 
uh, the, the firm, uh, the firm of Samuel Harris Limited had a had a large fleet of foreign going vessels. They were all three mass vessels called called after generals of the first war mostly. Well, they were the vessels that carried the the fish to market. That is Portugal, Spain, even up to Greece. And then, of course, the package article went to the West Indies and Brazil in casts with butts. They were put in uh, 224 pound casts, or yes, 224 pound casts, and 184s. They were packed in various sizes to, to meet the requirements of the particular market they were going to. I don't know. I think every I think every widow, a woman that their husband's going to sell, I think they they got an awful dread. They must have, you know, winter time especially. I mean, you know, the weather was, was the weather was terrible that winter, you know. And I can remember like getting up that morning, and I think I had five children in school then. Yeah, and uh, well, they went to school that morning, and they couldn't have any. You know, it was cold there, and all the heat was off. So uh, I remember Judy coming home and and saying that she heard, you know, children talking over school that one of the boats from either Fortune or Grand Bank had gone down. Well, she didn't know which one it was, and of course we didn't know either then, you know. So, um, I was uneasy because the manager of the plant had phoned on Sunday and said that, you know, the boat was due in. And the weather was so rough that, well, they wouldn't get in until Monday morning anyway. So certainly I called Dad. And uh, I think he'd heard sketches of it, you know, down around town. So then we phoned the plant. Well, they didn't say then that the boat was missing, you know, but they wouldn't say anything anyway. The disaster of the blue wave and blue mist affected the Anglican Church in this area more so than the United Church or the Salvation Army due to the fact that the Anglican Church in Grand Bank wasn't started until 1952 and most of the men came from the island known as Brunet came here and started the congregation. On the blue, wa blue wave, the Anglican Church lost 12 men, and on the blue mist, uh, six were lost. Since that time, I feel that the relatives, uh, mothers and children who have fathers, husbands on those boats, have a greater fear of the sea than they did before. Those boats go out, stay out about 10, 12 days all the year round. And in the winter time, in the gales, frost and heavy seas, it makes the relatives not as much afraid, I don't think, but they are in a state of awe all the time that their husbands and fathers are gone. It's, it's quite sad to see the children of the fathers who were lost going around this town, although they're well cared for and well brought up by the mothers, but yet there's always a sense of loneliness within the families due to this fact.
But now we will last going off last year's bank and the vessel's like hotel. And these draggers down there now, if you went 